there you are, recording in progress, um, so you know. Um, and um, we had a request. Uh, I mean, I think what we'll do is at the end, we'll have questions. You can put up your electronic hands, uh, and I'll invite you to, to answer the questions, uh, ask the questions yourself, rather than uh, me read, reading them out. And in, in the meantime, I'm going to see if it's possible um, to allow you to turn on your cameras and to all feel like uh, you are in an event. Um, I'm not quite sure how to do that. Um, so I may, uh, I might have to do it. Paul, do you know if I, if I promote everyone to panelist, will that complicate things? No, that's that's how that should do it. That should give them camera that, that and should do it. access. Okay. And you I'm can gonna, control them then. I'm going to individually uh, upgrade you all from attendee to panelist, which will give you the opportunity to have your camera on so that you can see each other and feel like you're more uh, at, at an event. Uh, and we're going to try. Uh, do that. So I'm going to do that one at a time. Um, it'll just take me a moment. Um, just bear with me because this is all new. Um, I'm starting to see some faces. I'm not looking at them though, because I'm concentrating on what I'm doing. And uh, and I think, I think, I think I may have done it. So those of you who are happy to be visible and seen may turn on your cameras and your, and even, I think, you know, I think you're even responsible enough to turn on your microphones um, if you, if you really do need to interrupt. Uh, but the way we'll do it, this, uh, the way we will do it is uh, with the electronic hands and I, and I will uh, invite you uh, individually to ask your questions at the end. And so with all of that ado, let's have no further. And pass over to you, uh, Paul, uh, with our with our thanks. Alan, thank you very much for having me. Uh, just before we start, people, uh, I will just say that should I note notice that the connection gets a bit jumpy and that you may not have heard me, uh, I will try and repeat myself. Uh, I'll do a test run with the first paragraph and then just make sure everyone can hear me uh, and then I'll take it from there. Uh, it's very nice to be here. I have tried in vain for many years to try and get on this um, this wonderful seminar series. So I'm absolutely ecstatic that uh, I was invited this year to present um, my research on the, the Royal Naval Coast Volunteers. Um, great to see some familiar faces there, Catherine, lovely to see you. Um, and some new faces as well. Uh, this piece of research originated out of my PhD on the Crimean War, um, which Alan alluded to earlier on. Um, you can find the details on that in my published work, as well as the original manuscript held uh, by Queen's. Um, it originated out of just a couple of breadcrumbs that I came across in preceding works on Ireland and the Crimean War by Brian Griffin and David Murphy. Just little hints and references to this, this force, and I didn't know anything else about it. And again, finding breadcrumbs when reading the primary primary sources at the time, such as the, the local the newspapers of, around the United Kingdom. Um, I went on a little journey over the last several years to really uncover it because it is something, it is a force that does not get a lot of attention at all in the historiographies, whether they be the naval or the maritime. Um, Alan, you might just make sure all the mics are off there. The okay. other thing would be, I should just say, that there is also been done on reserves generally. Um, one does come across, I'm sure, and several of them will have published works, but a lot of them are under-researched, so I do hope that this adds to it. And then finally, I will ask, add my thanks to the Society of Nautical Research and the Anderson Bequest Fund, which has um, helped me to undertake some of the research to provide the information for you tonight. So let's begin. When it comes to the naval history of the Crimean War, the subject, the job subjects of operations in the several theatres, the ships and their officers predominate. 
very little attention has been given to the manning of the Navy or to the domestic services during those years. And I'll just share my screen while I'm here, just so that you can see what it is I'm actually talking about. Silly me. Um, that being said, these topics have been discussed briefly, i.e. the manning and the def domestic defence services uh, in the principal works in this area. That being said, these topics have, uh, sorry, these have, topics have been discussed briefly in several general naval and maritime Um, histories of Britain and Ireland and stuff. So I mean, when I say that, I mean histories of the Coast Guard or the Royal Naval Reserve. In all cases, though the focus has been on uh, has been on on the Admiralty struggle. So when it comes to this period, so the Crimean War period, the focus has been on the Admiralty struggle to get the fleets up to strength quickly in 1854 and to maintain and build capacity and capabilities during the war years. Commentary also includes the fact that the Baltic fleet was largely manned by thousands of experienced but aged coast guards, but also the critique of the Admiralty and the government that the Admiralty and government received in Parliament in the Peace of 1856. So those are the areas that you generally find referenced in the historiography of present relative to the Crimean War. And that critique that I mentioned led to a very short, in the short term, the transfer of the Coast Guard to full Admiralty control and in the medium and long term to the creation of the Royal Naval Reserve. And we'll just get a couple of nods if you could hear me clearly there for that paragraph. Yeah, okay, great, I'll go on. So despite these various references to the problems around manning in the general histories, one key factor in the process of manning the Navy has remained largely omitted, namely the effort to establish a new home defence force during those years. And that is, of course, the Royal Naval Coast Volunteers. This was a force that has, it's a force that which has also received its share of criticism um, from disgruntled MPs in 1856 and which has never received its just attention from naval historians, despite existing for 20 years between 1853 and 1873 and comprising over 6,800 men at its peak. This is not to say that it has been totally ignored. Passing references, too often disparaging, can be found in several general naval and maritime histories and some recent dissertations in two histories of the Coast Guard and three works on Ireland of the Crimean War and in the works of J.S. Bromley. Yet no detailed study has yet been completed. The RNCV is not alone in this lack of scholarship as new research on Britain's various naval reserves, especially in the 19th century, remains limited to those previously cited works, but also to articles by, more recently by John Owen and Ben Thomas and the dissertation of Jerome Devitt. All of the works are decades old, limited in their engagement or problematic due to a lack of citations or bibliography. It's, just, it's, it's, it's a strange and recurring theme that one finds within the, the naval reserve historiographies. And it's a shame because then it leaves one really wondering about what's been written in front of one. Regardless, during the years of 1854 to 56, while wartime naval operations at sea and on land were ongoing, the Admiralty, via the Coast Guard, was actively pursuing the government's policy, governed by the Naval Coast Volunteers Act of 1853, here and after the NCV Act, to establish, man and train the Royal Naval Coast Volunteers. As Bromley has shown, the origins of the RNCV can be traced back to the Siemens Register of 1696, and it's all part of this ethos of a sea militia and trying to create this entity over about 150 years. And it can be charted through that 150 years by a debate around the creation of said sea militia from Britain and Ireland's non-merchant marine seafarers. These ongoing debates were given platform in 1852, when in the wake of Louis Napoleon's coup and the onset of yet another French invasion scare, and driven by long-standing manpower debates, the Admiralty formed a committee of inquiry to investigate the issues of manning the fleets and to creating a viable reserve. Under the chairmanship of Admiral William Parker, the committee investigated and made recommendations on not only the improvement of paying conditions and the overall mechanism by which sailors were created, but also on the creation of a large wartime reserve of men who could, be prom could promptly augment the fleet in a time of crisis. Many elements of the Parker Commission Committee's report submitted to government in early months 53 1853 were then incorporated into the NCV Bill 
which was received its royal assent on the 11th of August 1853. And that laid the foundation for the creation of the new reserve, one that would, like the Royal Naval Reserve that succeeded it in 1860, at least initially, rely heavily upon the Coast Guard for its officers and thus recruitment, organisation and pay, and for its training, equipment, facilities and locations. So the NCV Act itself comprised 24 provisions that empowered and more importantly funded the Admiralty to raise a force of 10,000 men for a perceived cost of £50,000 per annum. The force was to consist entirely of quote-unquote seafaring persons who were not registered under the provisions of the Registration Acts and were exempt from the land militia service. Men were to be between the ages of 18 and 35 and would enrol for five years of service. For their peacetime service, they would receive a, a bounty of six pounds in instalments at the date of their, their enrolment of every year of service. Once a year for 28 days, the men would then be trained principally in the great guns, but also in mu musket and cutlass. This was to be done under the superintendence of senior Coast Guard officers, and at a time of year that would impact least upon those men, primarily fishermen, and during which time they would receive regular seamen's pay but were also subject to naval discipline. Designated rendezvous for the collection of men were to be created along with transport arrangements to bring them to places of training or elsewhere in times of emergency. In such cases of emergency, quote unquote, all enrolled men were liable for service afloat for one year and possibly two under royal proclamation only. During that period, they would not be sent further than 100 leagues from the coastline of the United Kingdom and thereby consigning them solely, at least in theory, to coastal defence. Thereafter, they will be discharged. So that just gives you an overview of what, who these men and where, under what provisions they were to be brought together, how much money they would get. Anyone who's familiar with the British Marshal Services of, of the 19th century will recognise how similar that uh, whole thing is to the land militia and the service of the land militia with the month's training and the bounty and so on and so forth. So it is very much a militia of the sea. So you can see where the template comes from. Owing to the small scale engagement of modern historians in the RNCB to date, and thus the need for extensive research of the service, this, this paper is admittedly a limited study. Limited in scope chronologically, as it only looks at the service's first three years of existence and limited methodologically, as it only employs a bottom-up perspective. Although its geographical focus is broad, employing a four-nations approach, which serves to expand beyond the traditional Anglo-centric history of the Royal Navy, it, inclu it to include and give greater attention to both to Ireland, Scotland, Wales as well. This approach, as Naomi Lloyd-Jones and Maggie Smith have argued, makes this article multi-perspectival multi and permits a quote-unquote holistic or organic account of what was a British institution by, of both Great Britain and Ireland. This it does by utilising a large cross-section of contemporary national and local newspapers, in addition to a selection of parliamentary minutes, reports and bills for context. It is the purpose of this paper to document the efforts to raise the RNCV starting in the first weeks of January 1854, just months before the war with Russia broke out, and charting its development through the war years from that bottom-up perspective, before ending with a brief appraisal of those activities within the context of similar efforts to embody predecessor and successor naval reserves. So that's the background and overview. So let's get into and nuts and bolts of this. The organization of the RNCV. So it was established, the establishment of the new reserve began in earnest on New Year's Day, 1854. So they didn't waste much time, the passing of the act in August of the preceding year, once 54 rolls around there, they're straight out. And one can find that in the very first edition of the Times of that year, which reported that several officers had received new commissions in that very week, um, and that they were to be quote unquote born on the books of the fish guard under Commodore Superintendent John Shepherd. The ship was to be based at Woolwich Dockyard in, Do in London, and it was there that the headquarters of the RNCV was effectively established under further superintendents of Captain Superintendent Robert Smith. 
Additionally, it comprised six outstations. And now I can actually proceed with my slides, hopefully. Let's see, now, there we go. So this is the way it was broken down. The whole United Kingdom was broken into six districts or what was termed outstations. You had one district for Ireland, one district for Scotland, and England and Wales was subdivided into four districts, each of which was overseen by a senior Coast Guard officer. I'll give you a bit more detail about where the boundaries lay as we go along. But as I said, Ireland and Scotland were their own distinct districts. These, the commanders of these were, as I said, senior naval officers. Um, there were Captain Robert Craigie in Scotland and in England and Wales, there was James Baker, Henry Broadhead, William Sheringham and Peter Fisher. And in Ireland, there was Arthur William Jerningham. Each of these, of the several stations, and I include London and that, also had a paymaster assigned to them. These district commanders were all experienced officers with between 30 and 40 years uh, in the service. They held the rank of captain in 1854. Most had joined and served their years during the wars of France and had served on several ships and stations during the subsequent decades. Baker, Broadhead and Sheringham were all on ship's books in the years preceding the establishment of the US NCB. Uh, with the late, with the latter two, in, with the latter, sorry, involved in surveying the British coasts. Jerningham and Fisher had been with Coast Guard for several years preceding, excuse me, while Craigie and his successor, which was a, a Captain John Fraser from 1855 onwards, were on half pay for over a decade preceding. So we have a kind of a mixed, a mixed bunch um, taking up these positions at the time, but all very experienced officers. As the map shows, together the officers' commands covered the entire coastline of Britain and Ireland. Evidently, by assigning four officers to England and Wales, the Admiralty expected that it would, that that region or kingdom, as it was referred to as at the time, would provide the majority of the recruits. This was no doubt based upon the region's contribution to the regular navy, which was clearly illustrated in the 1852 census of the navy, which showed that England alone provided 79.7% of ratings in the navy. Each of the three kingdoms were required to provide a quota for the now 10,000 strong force. And you'll see that on the next page. So again, just up the top, you see the six districts, the regions that they cover from, two from, kind of broken down by towns, cities. And then at the bottom, you'll see the allotted quotas for the various districts. So we saw, we see that Scotland had to provide 1,500, Ireland to provide 1,000, and that remaining 7,500 broken down between the four English and Welsh districts. What is apparent from contemporary reports in a cross-section of newspapers is the method of recruitment was very hands-on and laborious for these officers. Not only did they have to travel throughout their districts on board ship and even upriver to inform would-be recruits of the nature of the service through public meetings and to invite them to join, but they also had to assess and enrol them. Thereafter, they had to establish rendezvous from whence the men would be collected for their annual trainings to collect their pay for annual bounty. Under the terms of the NCB Act, the definition of who was to be recruited into the new service was very vague, being quote unquote, seafaring men and others who may be deemed suitable for the service. Consequently, the six officers were reported to have sought all manner of men, including seafaring people, watermen, pilots and coasters, turf boat men and quote unquote others engaged in various vocations on the river and its shores but it was fishermen who were the principal target and thus accounted for the majority of the, the men enrolled so let's look into the strategies of these six recruiters between january 1854 and the summer of 1855 the several district commanders of the new NCB, or really the six that I listed, visited scores of coastal and even inland settlements connected to the sea with major rivers. From Inverness all the way south around the coast of England and Wales to Preston in Britain and from Cork to Galway City in Ireland. So here you'll see this is where they were active. It's interesting in itself where there's gaps. Now I have to look, I haven't yet found real answers to this um, as to why they stopped and didn't go in certain ways. Now, maybe there's not reports that I'm finding. Obviously, if I get, if and when I get into the Admiralty report, 
costs in a, at a, a later juncture, we may see more in something might throw light on that. But from the bottom up perspective, the bottom up analysis that I've undertaken in the local and national newspapers, reports only re report them being active within these spheres. In Scotland, this is particularly interesting because the recent work um, by Ben Thomas on the RNC on the Royal Naval Reserve from about the 1870s into the 1930s shows that the majority of those recruits came from the Highlands and Islands on the western coast of Scotland. So why we see this disparity, I don't know. Um, in term, largely, or in, a certain answer can, of course, be found in the, in the 1852 census when we think about where our the majority of Navy men coming from. Um, and in Ireland especially, and in Scotland to a, to a degree, this is reflective. In Ireland, for example, 52% of naval recruits in 1852 come from Cork alone, down the very south of the country, with a further 12 to 14% coming from the western coast. So he certainly is. Jerningham is very logically targeting the biggest area uh, in Ireland's naval and maritime uh, culture and recruiting ground in that instance. But why Liverpool is left out in this instance, because I've yet to find a report of Baker going to Liverpool. I don't know. A later report does say that activity, there was active recruiting there at some point, but nothing is found in the reports and the newspaper reports in 1854 to 56. So again, there's still an awful long way to go with this, but this, I hope, give you at least tantalising um, insight into this particular force and how it was put together. So overall, the approach employed by the officers was a threefold one. It comprised giving prior notice to settlements of a forthcoming visit. So a, a letter to the local authority saying, I'm coming to the area, I'm going to be recruiting. This is, watch out for me. Conducting of a public meeting and a period of enrolment. Now, the meeting was, of course, the most important of these, for it was during this that most of the numerous recruiters strategies, which I'm going to list now, were employed by the officers. How exactly did they convince men to get into the force? Collectively, these fall into carrot and stick categories. Excuse me. The former comprised the personal approach, clear and detailed information, the use of regional rivalry, emphasis on go government transparency, service within home waters only, a detailed description of pay and conditions. And the latter, the stick, was the threat of impressment or some form of forced enrolment into naval service. Now, the talks, which are reported often at length in the local press, be it in England, Scotland, Wales, doesn't matter, uh, were more often attended by hundreds of local mariners. And they were most often taking place in, a, in a, a local prominent venue, usually where possible a town hall, but also in custom houses, sailors' homes, a variety of public halls, and in one instance on the local pier. And the way the information, again, derived from the enabling legislation, it's usually the same thing as is said by all six of the officers, uh, was then imparted in a very relatively uniform manner. The officers were all keen to clearly detail the terms and nature of the service, including the men's obligations in both times of peace and war and the pay conditions in both instances. They were also at pains to stress both the terms and natures of the service that they were all well above board. Nothing was to be hidden from them by the government and the service's origins in an act of parliament were often stressed. And because this was a very hallowed institution for Victorians, we see this in, in any studies of Victorian society, whatever it is today, whatever we think of Parliament today, at the time it was seen as if it's from an act of Parliament, if it's coming out of Parliament, it, it's got a bit of legitimacy to it. All of the officers were also very open about the fact that in the event of a national emergency or, or war, the men would could be drafted into the fleet for one or two years, but only only by royal proclamation. So again, illustrating this is in the act and there is a safeguard here. No one's going to be drafted willy-nilly. It's not down to just someone in Whitehall. So again, trying to put, put that again, a bit more of a, a stamp on it of approval of sorts, a legitimacy that it's act of parliament on one hand and then the, king, the queen on the other, um, just trying to assuage any, any doubts, any fears. The possibility at a time when the UK was deeply engaged in blockading Russia and known to be short of men, no doubt impacted on would-be recruits. So there's no references at, the, at this time in, in what I've seen to people say, well, we're at war now, so I'm definitely not enrolling. But we have to uh, take it into account that 
you're being told that you can be called up in an emergency and people are saying, well, we're in a national emergency. How am I going to be called up? They weren't. This is the interesting thing. It was never mobilized um, because there was no threat to the home front. So no need. But obviously it would have played on people's minds. Considerable emphasis was naturally placed on the enrollment bounty of six pounds. It's not It's not, a, it's not a paltry sum, and it's something that Ben Thomas focuses an awful lot on in his study of the Royal Naval Reserve in the following years. Again, the people he's actually studying are fishermen in the Highlands and Islands, so it's very much the successors of the Royal Naval Reserve, many of which actually went into, from the Royal Navy, Coast Volunteers in 73, would have gone in, folded into the Royal Naval Reserve in later years, so there's very much a synergy between our, our, our various researches. But the sum offered on a bounty was very enticing for Royal Naval Reservists, so it had to be very enticing for people in the 50s through the 70s in this, in this case. To this was added, um, as well as getting your bounty, you could get travel allowances to get to and from your place of rendezvous or train, while provisions and clothing were also to be provided during training periods. Men would also be eligible to attend Navy hospitals should they fall ill or be injured on training. So depending on which officer you're, you're reading the reports of, uh, some put more emphasis on this than others. So, for example, Baker, and when he was speaking in Wales, he put an awful lot of emphasis on all these smaller uh, benefits as well, especially the Naval Hospital, trying to say, you can get a lot of things out of this, you will always be looked after, really going for the hard sell. But there's an awful lot there, an awful lot of benefits for these men, should they enroll. So let's look at the carrot list in a bit more detail. So during recruitment, the officers were keen to influence men's feelings by highlighting past generations service, for example, during the last war is a, is a reference we see a lot, principally in the sea fencibles, while also encouraging men to protect their families and local communities. So very much an awful lot of, see a lot of references to um, remember what your father did, remember what your grandfather did in the fencibles. And in some instances, the officers get mixed up and they keep calling the RNCV the fencibles, the sea fencibles. So you can see how much it is the successor to that particular force. Regional rivalries were also to be used, both between towns in a specific locality and between the four nations. So in Scottish newspapers, you see reports of Craigie saying, well, in, in, in the south of England, they're, they're, they're rolling up in, in their hundreds. Let, let's not put left aside down in Scotland. We can, we can do it better as, as well as them or better. And we see it in England too. We see in the north of England, they're talking about, oh, well, across the border, they're, they're, they're all joining up. So let's not be outdone by the Scots. So we see that regional rifle being used. Familial connections, again, were further developed um, through promises made by officers that the men would not serve far from Britain and Ireland, would always be able to communicate with their families through the postal service. And officers also drew upon the assistance of local elites, and I'm sure this isn't uh, overly surprising. Mayors were usually in attendance at the public meetings held in town halls, and they would be joined by people from the local municipal authority magistrates, local military and naval officers. And in Ireland, here's a nuance of this whole setup, Roman Catholic clergy were also brought out alongside the local gentry um, and they proved invaluable. Reports can be found of Irish Catholic clergy permitting Jerningham to post recruitment poster notices on the church gates to speak to their congregations and of priests promoting the service within their churches and lastly of providing translation services to in Irish speaking areas so that would have been very important so down the south coast of Ireland the west coast of Ireland these are the areas with the highest level of Irish speaking population sometimes only speaking Irish so to have a translator in the region to be able to provide that service was invaluable and we also see that in North Wales in the in again the heartland of Welsh speaking um, peoples, the translation service were also needed. So those are our carrots. That's how we're enticing them in. But how are we going to really cajole them in? Well, there's always the old age fear of impressment. While the carrot strategies form the core mechanism employed by these six officers, they were not remiss to utilise the potent stick. Britain, the British and Irish historiographies are keen to stress that while Impressment remained available to the government throughout the 19th century by the 1850s, if not long before, both for the government and Admiralty, uh, it had been deemed impolitic to use it. Historians further argue that the failure to utilise it during the Crimean War proved that it was a dead letter. However, debates around the manning of the Navy during the war showed that it was still seen by some contemporaries to be a viable option for the British state. 
during public, public information events, all Lauren CV officers were keen to stress that the government, while it was loath to use impressment, if the men did not come forward voluntarily, they would have to use to it, they would have to resort to it. Now, despite this conciliatory approach, many English communities open, openly refused to come forward, as Sheringham later recounted, declaring that they would rather await compulsion than go forward willingly at that time. No such sentiments have yet been found to be expressed in Scotland or Ireland. So there's a very diff, there's a, we can see in the reports, there's a very different reception to this force, depending on where one is actually reading the reports. So the south of England and England, Wales as a whole, it's going to be bad. But in Scotland and Ireland, it's going to be good. And that is the reality. And there are various reasons for that. And I'll go into that in a little bit now. So just a little bit more communication before I, I move into the successes and failures. Although handbills circ and circulars to local authorities and local newspapers were also issued, the personal approach was primarily used by the recruiting officers. First, and the reasons for this were twofold. First, face-to-face -face and hands-on approach was primarily a method of recruiting right up to the First World War for both Army and Navy. Second, when dealing with these often isolated and close-knit communities, an accessible personal approach was both advisable and useful. This was certainly seems to have been the case in both Ireland and especially Scotland, where the RNCV was most successful, and the reports of their officers' receptions were more numerous and complimentary in the papers. It was also highlighted to be a desirable trait in Wales, and by it being highlighted as a desirable trait, it suggested that they didn't feel this particular officer, Baker, had it in him, that he wasn't a fate of the locality, that he, didn't be, he wasn't able to speak to the people. So successes and failures. There were multiple factors that deeply affected the recruitment of the RNCV during the Crimean War. And the first was that it was voluntary, and those people could and did say no, especially in England Wales. The second was the limitation of this personal approach I just mentioned, or more specifically, the person's personality. While all the recruiters were, in a, were established naval officers at the rank of captain and had the same legislation and terms of service to draw upon, their individual personalities and approaches played a key part. The differences were not only evident from the responses of the various maritime communities to the officers, but also the reports of their various public speeches. The, the ways in which the officers structured their speeches and where they placed the most emphasis on how they uh, or how they complemented would-be volunteers and play to their interests and concerns is all evident in the newspaper reports. Two of the most contrasting examples of this are the successful engagement of Jerningham with the women folk at, Cla at the Clada in Galway in February 1854 and the very hostile reception that Captain Fisher received at Lowestoft the following month. In the former instance, 300 men reportedly sought to enrol uh, with Jerningham at Galway, and the women folk declared that they would shame their men into joining by volunteering themselves should the men not come forward. While at Lowestoft, the government's proposal was denounced by the local mariners as claptraps, and Fisher was actually faced by a hostile deputation from the local maritime community who had a lot of grievances that they wanted to air and said no way would they be joining this reserve because they didn't trust the government and they didn't like the Admiralty, and so on and so forth. Of all six districts, Scotland was the most successful, with multiple newspaper reports and even the government claiming that it had met its quota of 1,500 men by the summer of 1854. A few other reports even claimed that it had exceeded its quota by 200 men. Ireland came second, raising between 600 and 720 men, depending on what you read, out of its total quota of 1,000. It's not bad. All this was in stark contrast to England and Wales which only provided one third of its 7,500 quota. This contrasting situation was due to three further factors. And I know I don't list an awful lot of factors as we go along, but unfortunately in a detailed ass assessment such as this, this is what we're going to have to deal with, unfortunately. But I do hope it's, it's, it's all clear as we go along. I hope my, my slides are helping. So the, what are those three factors that have led to such a poor uptake in England and Wales? Well. There are a couple of articles actually issued in the, in the Nautical magazine in 1858 by Captain Sheringham, and he's looking back on, on this, and he said, the first of these was the considerable and unflinching distrust of the Admiralty and government by maritime communities, especially in the south of England, due to past 
and current policies, including a precedent. The second was a failure by local authorities and business owners, especially in that area, to encourage the fishermen to enroll. And the third was that some fishermen perceived that to enroll was to then have their, their stable and valuable employments taken away. They would lose their income. So they, didn't, they, they felt they would lose out in a big way. So again, it obviously was not perhaps explained to them enough that you will not be able to go on, say, your service, your active service, uh, your your summer camp, as it were, your 28 days of, of training outside of the fishing season, for example. Um, but even if they were, say, um, called on board ship uh, onto active service, they certainly felt that they would lose a lot of money. So they were working for big companies down the south of England, making good uh, regular incomes, not like, say, the crofter fishermen, the, the part-time fishermen in England, in, in Scotland and Ireland, who were going to get made, make more money out of their service. In terms of impressment, due to its far larger maritime population and the greater proportion of merchant vessels, in its ports in England, especially southern England. Uh, so it bore the brunt back in the day of impressment, and that had a long memory. They had a long memory that they didn't trust the government. So I'm moving towards conclusion now, and what I'm going to do as part of my wrap up is to talk about the numbers actually wrong. So we talked about the strategies, we talked about where, we talked about who's, who did it. So let's see how much, how successful they actually were, and why, and how, uh, or where, I should say, and how much. Finally, by way of conclusion, is worth discussing the overall success of establishing and raising the RNCB during the Crimean War. Through the analysis of the contemporary newspapers, parliamentary debates, and the 1859 Manning the Navy report, what is evidence, evidence is that the total number of men enrolled into the new service by the end of 1856 is actually debated. During the first year, as early as June, the press and even the First Lord, as I said, were happily reporting that the force had actually met its half of its establishment with 5,000 men enrolled. Allowing for a rounding up, a House of Lords report issued in 1856 claimed that by December of that year, 1854, 4,001 men had been enrolled. So that's on the left of your screen there. That's the House of Lords report. They claim that. So if the press and the government were saying 1854, well, we got 5,000, we're in, the, we're in the kind of the same area. Also in 1856, just one month after that report during the debates around the naval estimates and as part of a general critique of the Navy during the Crimean War, a Colonel Lewis Buck, Conservative MP for North Devon, declared during the naval estimates debates um, specifically that by March of that year, a total of 4,819 men had been enrolled. So again, we're, we're kind of still within that 4,000 to 5,000 number. His figures allegedly came from a report that he requested, yeah, no doubt, from the Admiralty. However, these respectable and increasing reported wartime figures are contested by the published report of the 1858-59 Manning Commission. As you can see in the second table, it declared that between 1854 and 1856, only 3,548 men had been enrolled. So we've got a, we've got a bit of a gap here now, about 1,000 to 1,500. The difference between the 1856 and the 1859 reports is substantial. And while the true figure cannot be said at present, it is most likely that owing to hindsight and the fact that it was a commission of inquiry, that the latter figure of 3,548 is more accurate. An explanation of this disparity remains to be found. So I do hope to have uh, an answer in, in years to come, um, maybe on the next time I present this uh, research, um, or if someone else could enlighten me through other research, please get in contact and, we'll, and we, can, we, can come, we can shed some light on this. But at present, this is where we stand. Regardless of which final figure one uses, and based upon the cross-section of contemporary newspaper editorials reviewed, one can be relatively certain that Scotland contributed at least its quota of 1,500 men, whereby the 3rd of February, 1854, Craigie had reportedly enrolled so, some 600 men from between from 29 settlements in Morayshire, Banffshire and Nairnshire. This was followed by another 200 from Berkshire and East Lothian two weeks later. By June of that year, the Caledonian Mercury reported that he had just 200 men left to recruit. Ireland too seems to have done well, with, with Jerningham reportedly enrolling up to 720 men by the end of 1855. 
just a little bit of detail there on that. So putting all together various reports from various areas, I've pieced together numbers for Jerningham. And same I've done for Sherry, Sherningham and Baker, and the numbers are not great. But the, the reports, the actual reports of where they were and how much they got, they're, where I can find them, some, they're not great. And there, there seems to be a lot, a lot less coverage of the English and Welsh officers, or yeah, English and Welsh officers than there were in Scotland and Ireland. So this leaves the, the four other districts of England and Wales, which are supposed to provide 7,500 um, for the most populous regions of the UK, and um, not doing so, unfortunately. For while the four officers were often well received in the towns and cities that they visited, the cre with crowds of up to 500 or 600 attending to see hear them speak, in the days after when they would have their enrolment periods, very little would actually turn up, if anyone at all. The overall negative reception to the four officers by the maritime communities in England and Wales is an aspect of the 1854-56 recruitment efforts that requires far more detailed discussion than I can give here, as I've said. For now, all I can say is that the reception from Northumberland down to the south coast and around to Wales ranged from lukewarm to outright hostile. In stark contrast, the two other districts based upon the 1859 Manning Report, um, this left England and Wales providing just about 1,300 men, or 17% of its quota, so based upon those latter figures. Uh, and just over one third of the total number recruited from the United Kingdom. Unfortunately, no firm total figures have yet been found. So again, if I look in some of the, Sc in the Scottish papers or the Irish papers, there are claims of 600 maybe, or the 1500 in Scotland. But none of the English or Welsh papers could give an overall figure of what they thought had been recruited in those regions, which I find very strange and very unusual. But that's, that's, that was the case. As I said, there's some piecemeal figures that I was able to cobble together from the various reports um, just for sharing on Baker to give you an idea of what they were pulling in in the various localities. Regardless of the actual num the numbers actually enrolled, any expectation that the RNCB could reach its full establishment within one or even three years was hugely unrealistic repeat, for the contemporaries. And those criticisms of this state of affairs by both contemporaries in the 1850s and even by modern historians and they do exist. The few references that can be found in some of the, the modern historiography, they, they, they announce it. They say it was, a, it, was a, it, was, it was a flash in the pan kind of organization and it wasn't very successful and so on and so forth. I think it's very unfair. And when you actually start drilling down into it, as I've done here, we see that it actually was much more successful than it's been given credit for. And I do hope to show that more as I go along. And this was especially at a time when the United Kingdom was at war. So again, it has to be cut a bit slack on that score. The Navy was in a desperate need for men. A large portion of the Merchant Marine was tendered out to government and lucrative contracts. And the spectre of impressment still loomed large over the maritime population. So all those things have to be taken into account when you're even looking at just this small period within the history of the organization. Yet as J.S. Bromley highlighted, and others have also confirmed, this was not the first time or the last time that such un realistic expectations were placed upon a naval reserve. Or the, time, or the first or last time that an organization such as this had taken one or several years to reach anywhere near its establishment. For way back during the reign of William and Mary, when the Naval Register, which I mentioned at the start, was established in 1696, that register was meant, meant to, to raise a force of 30,000 mariners from Britain and possibly Ireland, so I have to look into that. But only 13,000 men were raised in that first year. 13,000 out of 30, it's 10, 10 odd percent. Only a further 4,000 joined by 1702, six years later. It was only, so about six, after six years of enrolment, it was only up to about 55%. And this was despite the men being paid a bounty of two pounds a year, double prize money and access to Greenwich Hospital. Over a century and a half later, when the Royal Naval Reserve was established under Act of Parliament, with an enrolment beginning in 1860, it had recruited just 5,000 men out of what was supposed to be 30,000 in its first 18 months. So that's 16% within 18 months. And it was only up to about 15,000 15, within its first six years. It's 15,000, so it got about halfway up. 
in six years. So with those two benchmarks, for the RNCV to have been reached perhaps 27% of its, of its strength, if we take the 1850 million figures, uh, or perhaps 40% if we take the A parliamentary figures that I mentioned earlier, I'll just click back to them there. So if we're working off the 4,000 on the left, 4,000 or 10,000, that's pretty good, 40% within three years, or even one year on that in that score, or 35% if we go with the 1859 figures within the first three years. And by the way, if we go within that, it has to be deemed as a great success. And to illustrate this further, the ability of Jerningham to enroll between 600 and 720 men by the mid-1850s was in itself a great feat, when only 10 years later, the total number of Royal Naval Reserve recruits, and that's new recruits and re-enrollments re in the year of um, that's 1865, 1865, stood at only 294. So new enrollments and re-enrollments of the Royal Reserve in 1865 stood at 294, but 10 years earlier, Jerningham can enroll anywhere up to 600, 700 men. So of which in 1865, 187 were second-class seamen, so the kind of stock that were being recruited in the 1850s. So huge drop in numbers as were in a different, in a different era, but again, showing that there's a bit of strength there in the 1850s for the, for the, the coast volunteers. Finally, what this preliminary investigation of the Royal Naval Coast Volunteers during its first three years, i.e. the Crimean War, shows is that despite it being under-researched to date and being criticised or dismiss, dismissed by contemporaries and multiple modern historians, the service represents a fertile ground for further study. One that, when conducted using both multi-directional and diverse perspectives will provide an original and hugely informative insight into the operational realities of establishing and maintaining Britain's naval reserve in the long 19th century, but also the relationship between the British state and the various classes of mariner whom it sought as volunteer recruits. Excuse me. This paper makes a small contribution in both these respects. The model used here is one that can and should be applied both to the future studies of the RNCV and to all five of the reserve formed between 1822 and 1903. Whatever its failings between 1853 and 1873, or more specifically the failings of successive boards of admiralty and governments at Whitehall to properly cultivate both that service and the coastal communities of the United Kingdom from whence it was derived, the Royal Naval Coast Volunteers was a major developmental milestone in the creation of both today's Royal Navy and its Royal Naval Reserve. Thank you. Very good. Thank you very much, Paul. That was uh, really, really interesting. And um, I don't know how to simulate applause. I think you've done enough uh, experimenting with that. Thank you, uh, Kathy's done it. And it's, it's visual applause that you, you so fully uh, deserve. Um, uh, yes, thanks for that. I, I wonder, you know, um, before I open it up to questions to other people, if you could just help me out a little bit, because, <clears throat> you know, I'm, I'm thinking to myself, I don't blame people uh, for being distrustful, right? I mean, the timing of the Crimean War and, and this is um, you know, not, not coincidental. Um, and, you know, if you could be drafted in uh, then that's going to be a, a, a serious threat. So what I'm what I'm what I'm wondering is, you know, you, you say that it was ne it was it never never mobilized because there was no no threat to the coast. What I'm wondering is if you, if you could say more about what 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 did these people actually do? I mean, what you know, if you were recruited into this, you say there, there, you say there's reluctance to join, um, and and for good reason because of, because of that fear. But but what else were they meant to be doing? Tell us more about what a naval uh, uh, coastal uh, coast volunteer did, if you would? It's a good question. And at the time, it was one that still remained to be answered. And um, there's, when it got to 1856, that was part of the stick that they used to beat the, the, the force with. It's like, well, they never got called out and they never did anything. So why are we paying £50,000 a year to, to keep them going? Um, mm. One report, I did find reports of, Craigie actually taking them out on um, 
so on their annual sir on, on their annual training in and around edinburgh and it's the only re reference i did find so it's very strange that it was done so they were taken on board a ship where they were supposed to be trained now according to the legislation they were supposed to be trained in firearms cutlass uh, and, and basic weaponry and effectively what was to be expected of them at the end of the day was they would be gunners that's how it's going to go um theoretically they could be they're going to be on the ship as able seamen of, of and be expected to do the basic things that a seaman would do but go as we know me. even at, in now not now that will begin in in home waters so working with within home waters on naval vessels they would be acting they would be drafted on board uh, as basic ratings and they will be trained in 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 their in use of guns and 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 the basic the basic day to day operations of 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 a, of a, of a regular rating. Hmm. Sounds to me like not such a bad deal, and therefore you know the 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 the, the, the recruitment problems seem almost almost puzzling. Or am I being naive? It it is puzzling. I mean, it, it, and and again. It's something I'd love to, I can't wait to explore more once I can get into Q and take this further over the next few couple of years, is to again follow on from this period, which seems to be a, a very po positive, at least in again, Scotland and Ireland, that what, what are the numbers and from where and so on into the 60s and 70s, because what Ben Thomas is showing me and shows the rest of us from the 70s through to the 1930s, the same cohort of Britain and Ireland's maritime community or specifically in the Highlands and Islands, the fishermen, the crofter fishermen, are, are, are falling over themselves to get into the Royal Naval Reserve as second-class seamen. And that's <laughs> exactly what they are in this period. And it's the same in Ireland on the onset, again, in the south and west coast, in Galway specifically, there is a huge impact of the First World War on the local maritime community because they're all called up into the reserve. They all join in the 1890s, 1910s, when there's peace and they can get their six bob a year or 12 bob a year. And mm -hmm. all of a sudden there's a national, there's a huge war and they're all called off to the Baltic. However, it made a huge impact. And we saw the same throughout the United Kingdom at the time in the Highlands and Ireland. Mm -hmm. Very good. Um, so if they can be all joining the one reserve, why aren't they joining the Orange City? Yeah. Right. Uh, good questions. Okay. Um, any um, other questions from anybody or comments anybody would like to, to, to make? Hello. Um, sorry, can you hear me, hear me Alan? Yes, we can. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Thank you. Can, can I ask Paul? Um, this uh, question of impressment is, interests me. So is it actually that they were threatened with the possibility of impressment to be put in the RNCV? Or that I can understand that there might, you know, you can maybe use a threat of impressment. If you, if you don't watch out, you'll be impressed and you'll be sent out to the Baltic with a fleet or something like that. But it doesn't seem to me a very realistic threat that you're, you're if you're impressed, you'll spend a fortnight a year train. Uh, 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 sorry, for twenty eight days a year training with us. No, you're <laughs> uh, you're got it bang on. It's 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 impressment into the into the regular navy. That's that's the threat. So they're saying if yeah. if if the state can't get the men it needs to protect home waters and thus you know free up regular seamen to get into the Baltic and into the Black Sea and wherever, then they're going to pull you into the regular navy. To so fill, that's fill what the we're gaps. talking about, not not. And, and that's what comes back to Alan's point is like, why wouldn't you take twenty eight days and six bob over five years to do practically nothing uh, and risk? And, and, and openly tell these recruiters, I'll take impressment, you come and get me. Um, I'm not joining you voluntarily for six bob for five years. It doesn't make sense. But it, it, what, it man what it shows is how deeply ingrained this distrust and hatred is. And again, like people like um, Brian Lavery are showing it in his book, Shield of Empire, that in 1866 and, and thereafter, you get a Royal Naval vessel turning up to the Shetlands and, and lots of heading for the hills thinking they're going to be impressed. And it's 60 years since they were last impressed, nearly. Um, it, they, there's long memories, long memories in these communities at the time. And it's, it's very evident even in, north, in the north of England, around Sunderland and Newcastle, that the communities are talking to each other. It's reported that Broadhead can't make any inroads with these people because they've got these 
long established intercommunal communication lines where if one village thinks this guy isn't for real then everyone along the whole coast thinks he's not for real and they're not going to bite so yeah the fear is we'll go in the royal navy but i think they're giving up a, a, a good a good a good chance for not doing so Thank you. It'll um, be a folk memory, obviously, which might be completely at odds with reality, but that hardly matters. Absolutely. Good, thanks. Um, uh, Ian Stafford, you are there. You had a question. Oh, we can't hear you, though. If you could... Oh, do I need to unmute you? Uh, ask to unmute. Um, the... Uh... How did the uh, decision for the establishment of this come about? Um, is it based on some uh, admiralty um, assessment of the danger to uh, her mortars, i.e. need, or is it uh, a matter of um, treasury budget? The establishment comes from the Parker Report, the Parker Committee Report of 1852-53. to So if you, if you read that in detail, if you read the work of... J.S. Bromley, you'll see that there was an awful lot of appetite there and interest in creating some form of reserve beyond the Coast Guard. And they kept coming back to the thing of, we've got thousands upon thousands of fishermen around the coast. We mobilized them as fencibles back in the last war. Surely, surely we can do something with these guys now. So it's a case of, well, we need a reserve of some description. We need to be able to beef up the Navy in an in a, in a, an emergency so let's create something so what comes out of it there's several forms of a force are, are pitched to the committee by by people in the know by senior officers and so on during that period of, of, of committee work and out of that are recommendations in the report for let's do this form 10 20 30 000 fishermen into an, a body under the coast guard and funded from the treasury um, and they, they can get away with it. They, they can convince the Admiralty, and the Admiralty obviously convinces, and government convinces the Treasury to let the money out. So 50,000, it's big money. But what we also see is it starts to decline as the years go on. When they're not getting the numbers in, that's getting slashed and slashed, and then they're only getting enough effectively to meet establishment costs. But still, they're running a force of about 6,500 by the mid-60s and about 10 or less grand a year, which is pretty economical. And that was the big argument they are saying. You pay these guys £6 for five years, it's peanuts compared to keeping thousands of fully trained, able seamen on the books and keeping ships in the water. It's, it's a much better deal. Okay, very good. Um, I wonder if Kevin Ellsbeek would come in from the cold and warm up and uh, ask uh, his question. Please. Are you... We can't. I can't hear you. No, uh, something's gone wrong. I got another microphone. There we are. It's the cold, you see. The cold is yeah, down. Yeah, you now, Kevin. Can you hear me? You got me. Okay, sorry about that. I forgot to put the mic in. Um, yeah, um, this is this is cold out here in Norfolk this evening, so uh, changing the weather. Um, yeah, Paul, thank you very much. That was a great presentation. I, it's really a quick question, sort of following on from Ian in a way. Um, do you have any data in terms of how much impressment was brought into play, given particularly in the English regions, the recruitment was less than uh, anticipated or the numbers didn't quite fill, you know, fulfill? From the reports, I mean, it's, it's always mentioned. It's always mentioned. Again, again it's, 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 it's interesting when we, we view the, the structure of these reports, as to, again, where, is it, where they place the emphasis. Some are really playing up the, the money. Some are really playing up the community. And some, again, this is where we come back to the likes of Fisher, um, really putting too much emphasis, I find. I mean, maybe it's, a, just a, it's, it's just the nature of what he was getting back from the crowds, but he puts too much effort. It's just a hot impressment. He's like telling them, you know, if you guys don't 
you don't enroll today. Well, you're not the men I taught you were. You're all you're all yellow bellied. Like he's he's effectively calling them out, and it's very aggressive. His tone gets is very aggressive in the reports. It's and it's very com- jarring with the other five. So that's why I, I pull him up there uh, in terms of the difference in presentation style and the personability of these officers. Again, it all a lot comes down to the person and how they can present themselves. You read the reports from the papers and Craig, he's been held up as this really nice guy. He's got a great record. He's a, he's a native of Scotland. But it, you don't have to be a native necessarily because Jernigan's an Englishman and he's doing great in the southwest of Ireland in the most Irish of Irish places. So it, it's a case of like... He's the one, he's a great example of how much is being pushed. The other three not pushing it as much. They're all mentioning it. Again, they're very keen not to hide things. And they keep saying, we're very forthright with you. The government is being honest. And the mayors are saying the same thing. It's all this whole thing of there's no subterfuge here. But of course, anyone who knows anything about the Crimean War period, where they enroll a load of guys for short-term service, and then they pay them off in 56 when, the, when it gets tight on the purse string. Rings. And that was a real kick in the teeth again, because Palmerston and, and the Aberdeen government were talking about, we're going to be very honest with the Mariners again, we're not going back to the, the to the underhanded impressment tactics of the French, the wars of the French. And they do something about the same again, and, and again, it's another kick in the teeth. So they're almost vindicated in their lack of trust in these communities, because they are, there is a stab, but there is a stab, not in the back, but in the front again, by Palmerston in 56, 57, when he pays everyone off, when he said he wasn't going to do it. So it's there. And it's always mentioned, and again, some are really hammering it, and most are not. I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Um, I, I'm wondering um, now. You know, you had your map of the re, of the recruitment, and and the, and there were gaps, right, where they 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 yep. they, they didn't bother, and 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 you were speculating about why. And and I'm just wondering if if if, if it's a yeah, there there we are. If that's a if that's a pattern that's replicated, you know, in 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 later decades, you know, in in other in other recruitment in other in other in other periods, and if you know if this is an established pattern or if it's particular to. Uh, 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 to this period, and I don't know if you if you if you know or, or or want to speculate about that. I don't know, and I won't speculate at present. I'd I, I need to deal delve more into the into the nuts and bolts um, recruitment areas of the R and R, for example, to see where because again, that's the successor organization. They run parallel. Okay, all right. Um, Cass- for about ten years, and then the, the right. RCB has kind of folded into it as a second class stock. Mm-hmm. So it'd be interesting to see again, yeah, is that, it doesn't seem to, so from the basic mm-hmm. histories that I've read so far, there's a lot more, in certain areas like Liverpool and Sunderland, there is very much, uh, a much better response in those areas. So again, they maybe see that particular organisation as a bit more trustworthy. Some of the shipping firms are getting behind that, say up in Sunderland, the, the port master, for example, I think it was, he was reported to be standing up on the, on the podium. Um, and that's an organisation that's, Run by both the Board of Trade and the Admiralty in in in, in tandem. So it's a, it's just a strange kind of hybrid organisation, um, but seems to get a bit more traction in certain areas. But again, I said it certainly has the flip carry on when it comes to Scotland, where we see only recruitment on the east coast in the Crimean War years, and then when it comes to the Or North, about twenty years later, it's 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 flipped to the to the west coast more predominantly. Interesting, interesting. Okay, thank you. Uh, Kathy, then. Here's. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm just kind of thinking, uh, Paul, thank you for, for the paper. It, it is really, really interesting. Um, and, I, and I was just kind of thinking, I know we've, we've had kind of discussions about um, the lack of research on the Coast Guard um, in particular. And just as you were speaking, I was also wondering what perhaps were the relationship of some of these coastal communities with the with the Coast Guard itself, um, knowing that in some cases there was, um, so depending upon the Coast Guard officers um, and how how they worked with the communities and were seen to be, um, you know, trying to help out fishermen, you know, as far as as in, uh, and not just the life saving, but like a, a lot of them were also operating as honorary um, agents for the, the Shipwreck Mariner Society, for instance. So, a lot, and a lot of fishermen had joined the Shipwreck Mariner Society. 
um, so, so that they would uh, get help if they lost their, their boats or nets or whatever. So, so I, I'm just wondering about, about that kind of relationship that might have been set up. So I'm, I'm thinking of a, of a few that were actually um, up in, in Wick, for instance, and in this, in this pipe, you know, outside of, of the area that, that you're showing of recruitment. But in some cases with some Coast Guard, you know, even though they were the bad guys because of stopping smuggling and all that, but in, in other ways, they were they had some of the community um, at heart, you know, wh whether it be shipwreck mariners or, or pushing for harbors of refuge and that sort, sort of thing at this time. So I'm just going to kind of throw out there, you know, kind of thoughts and no, you hit the nail. It, it is a very important point. It's something that doesn't come up in the reports at the time, but it's something that I found in the 15, 1858 and 59 Commission report. Um, they start looking into it a lot. So the, the RNCB gets a bit, good bit of screw. Me and that, and it's good. The likes of Sheringham are called up to report on it and its activity and how many, and that's where he gives his details saying, I really struggle. I really struggle to get guys from the south of England. He gives those three points that I made earlier on, the factors that he felt were really impacting. And it's in that report that, yes, the Coast Guard officers are mentioned, and it's where they start saying, yes, there is a lot of distrust to them, and there's an acrimony between, there's a tension between those southern English communities and the Coast Guard for exactly what you said, the anti-smuggling issues. So in certain areas, so on our, in Ireland, it's quite the opposite. Um, Darrell Brunkardi, he's described the Coast Guard in those in this era, at least, um, as being held up quite well in the post kind of Napoleonic smuggling eras. Um, they're seen as you know living within the community and are rescuers of the fishermen. So they're actually seen very well. And I kind of theorize that perhaps this is partly the, partly the reason why the RNCB was also well received, not only for the money, but as an adjunct to the Coast Guard. It's trained by the Coast Guard. It's 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 uh, it's officered by the Coast Guard. It's it's brought about by the Coast Guard. It, they they run the food in Coast Guard stations and things like that. It has a big relationship with them. So again, you flip that back to the south of England again. If you've got an, a population that has a negative perception and relationship with the Coast Guard, it's not going to have a good relationship with its adjunct. Um, force. So, yeah, it would have played, has to have played a factor in it, and unfortunate factor. Interesting. Thank you. Good. Good. Right. Well, thank you very much, uh, Paul. Uh, you've um, you've kicked us off really, really well. I think uh, for the for the uh, start of um, you know, this this year's uh, seminars. So we're all uh, very grateful. I certainly am. I certainly appreciate you. Um, Taking up the invitation and uh, and and being willing to lead, you know, you led us into the into the into the new uh, academic uh, year. So I think um, unless uh, anybody interrupts me, I am going to invite everybody, at least those with the cameras on, to do the uh, visual uh, applause thing again uh, because it's uh, well well deserved, um, and um, we will. Um, well, as I say, it, just express our, our, our gratitude and hope uh, and to look look forward to the next uh, uh, to the next meeting and, and, and wish you all the best in your ongoing project. Into, into well, and just before you go, I'll yeah. just say two things. Um, if anyone has any information on the RNC or would like to talk to me about it in any way, um, my contact details are there on the end of the slides. Um, please drop me an email or drop, contact me by Twitter at any point. I will also say that this paper is actually to be published in Mariner's Mirror next month in November. In November. So uh, if there's any details here you want to get a bit more on or you want to recap over this, uh, please feel free to pick it up. And uh, it's, it, everything I've said is, is in there and a little bit more. Well, we certainly will. I'll we'll look, we'll, look forward to that. I'm going to, um, yeah, I, I've just 